thank you ma'am uh, now i would like to welcome uh, our next presenter um uh, before inviting her i would like to um introduce her with you uh this is miss uh, christina adams uh she is an author researcher advisor editor of laguna beach uh, she is from california usa and uh, her expertise areas are camel uses sustainability camel dairy development and research uh, formal pastoralist herder challenges autism spectrum biological and nutritional factors in autism writing and media and uh, she is the winner of the dr v kurian award of excellence in dairy farming practices and innovation uh, so uh, welcome uh, miss christiana adams thank you very much i'm really glad to be here can you uh, can you yes i answer my screen okay okay great now. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'll be sharing my screen in just a moment. First, I want to uh, extend my appreciation for the kind introduction and just express how um, really awed I am at the amount of coordination and work uh, that yourself and of course, Dr. Arjuman and everyone else has put into this incredible endeavor. So uh, thank you for doing that. And I'm going to uh, share my screen in just a moment. So um, just briefly, I'll say that while this is um, the summer field school for mountain ecosystems and resource management, uh, that does have, of course, a wide catch basin. So we'll be talking about a lot of the uh, ecosystems today, which I'm sure you already have been. Um, I myself happen to come from a bit of a mountain background. Uh, my people are from the Appalachian Mountain area of Virginia, which is also kind of a distinct area. And I actually have spent the summer there and just came back to California. So I am newly inspired to, uh, to think about the mountains as well as the uh, deserts and other regions that I think about regularly. So uh, let me share my screen now. Okay, I think I'm up, is that correct? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank it's you. Feasible. Yeah. Okay, great. So my talk is uh, tonight called and in morning for you because it is 11 p.m. here in California and uh, morning in all different time zones in our gathering today. Uh, my talk uh, right now is a global perspective on pastoralist value. I feel that many, many, many people are not aware at all of the pastoralist cultures and the heritage um, in a lot of different countries. And so I myself have had the experience of becoming uh, aware of their great value. And uh, I wanna talk a little bit about that today and some of the challenges as well. So the, con the Convention on Biological Diversity says that many endangered species are surviving simply in zoos and botanical gardens. And uh, these kind of uh, protective measures are not sustainable for our endangered species. Species and ecosystems need freedom to evolve in their natural conditions. And economic policies are needed to create financial resources for those who would otherwise damage the natural resources that are surrounding them, which they often do just to survive. So the world is facing multiple crises, as we all know, and uh, we have about 10 years to act according to uh, some estimates. And traditional methods of living uh, can help sustain the biodiverse life that we all really depend on, even though we may not be aware of that in our more industrialized societies today. Indigenous and tribal people help sustain these really important genetic legacies. Indigenous people, which are estimated at four to 5% of world population, live in regions that contain the majority of our world's biodiverse resources. And traditional healing can be a key to medicine. Pharmaceuticals are sourced from biodiverse plants and animals. And it, it's kind of amazing to me how almost no people that I know that 
use medicines, which is the vast majority of you know, people at one point in time, are aware that pharmaceuticals actually come from plants and animals. There seems to be this divide between medicine and science versus the natural world. Um, and so I would like to see a little more um, uh, uh, kind of synchronicity between those uh, worlds. So these gene banks that are sustained in these uh, areas um, um, where uh, indigenous and tribal people and pastoral people live um, are really key to human and animal health. And not just because of pharmaceuticals, but because of a lot of things um, that are factors in our planet, which of course, uh, a lot of environmental issues and all, the, all those kinds of things. Uh, pastoral livestock uptakes appropriate nutrients and they process food directly. So it's less harmful processing and there's local sustainability and it increases soil health, which I know that other people have spoken about this and will continue to, but it really is something to um, be putting the message out for because most people think animal meat and dairy equal bad, at least where I am in the United States. Uh, a lot of you know, more progressive people are starting to think that. And it's something that I've been taking on recently to try to educate people that it is not one size fits all. Okay, where did my cursor go? There we go. So pastoralists and rangelands are important to the world. 54% of the world is rangelands uh, per the rangelands Atlas database. Rangelands are home to many nomadic and pastoral livestock keepers who are often what's called underrated. Uh, this biodiverse resource for our world can be exploited or experience desertification if it's not managed properly. Uh, so this is me when I met my, the first person I ever met who was a nomad. And um, this is um, El Haji Kumama. He is from Niger and his family has had camels for you know centuries and he his family also is, uh, are renowned jewelers. So he's one of the great examples of how pastoralists can have multiple skills. And he often comes over to the United States uh, like some other um, Niger jewelry makers and they sell their jewelry uh, to many people in the United States and other places and they do that regularly and then they go home and, and keep their animals or camels. So it's one of those ways where uh, they have used their ancient craft and skills to still uh, make money in the modern world. So uh, pastoralist traditions actually helped save my son. That's how I got into this whole area. Um, I had met a man with a camel in California and he happened to have Middle Eastern roots, but I didn't know that at the time. I was just at a children's book festival in California and I saw a camel there and I just went over to find out why is it here if no children are riding this camel? My son had autism. So after I talked to him, I just heard that it was, uh, that the milk was, um, thought to be non-allergenic and given to premature infants from the hospital in the Middle East. And that kind of sparked my idea that it might kind of help reboot my son's immune system, which was always connected to his autism symptoms. Um, I'd already written one book about this called A Real Boy, and I had just turned my life over to trying to get into biology and um, that's that connection to autism spectrum disorders, which is increasingly well established now. So at that point in time, there was no place to get uh, camel milk in America that I could find. So I had to fly in frozen Bedouin milk from uh, the Middle East. And uh, my son was, um, you know, really having challenges at the time, but no one else had really known about that. Um, except I did find a publication later, which confirmed I was on the right path. So nomadic people had known about camel milk's health benefits for centuries, but no one really had known that it would help autism um, until uh, after I had my idea. I said, I, you know, as I said, I came across that one science publication. So um, I actually got it in, as you saw in the prior slide, of those frozen bottles. And then this is my son. He was my own little clinical experiment. Um, he was given a half a cup of camel milk with cereal at his bedtime. The next morning, his uh, symptoms were greatly improved. His skills leaped up overnight. It was actually very shocking. He said things like, I love you. You do so much for me. You're really great. He could start crossing the parking lot alone instead of hanging on to him, which is something a lot of parents of autistic children have to do. Um, his behavioral breakdown stopped, and it was absolutely astonishing. And... Uh, it started to work systemically. The white bumps on his cheeks faded. He returned to public school. Um, if you know anything about autism, I could go on about all the symptomology, but uh, I, I do have other lectures for that if anyone ever needs that in the future. He was able to tolerate more foods. Overall, he had a 30% improvement in autism symptoms. 
And then I kept flying it in and I got USDA federal permission, that's the United States government uh, agricultural authority uh, to import it for him. And so um, after I was able to find out that the milk was being made in America then by pastoral people, uh, at that time, Amish people, um, I was able to get the milk from here. I gave it to my son and it worked the same as the Middle Eastern milk, which was a very important person, uh, key point. He was pretty much the first patient that I'd ever heard of that used uh, camel milk from two places and showed it wasn't the breed, the feed or the camel. It was the camel itself that was the delivery method for this amazing milk. So I wrote an article that went viral and kind of kicked off a lot of new interest in the camel milk um, globally. And then I was able to write a, uh, a peer reviewed scientific journal report and uh, that generated some scientific interest and uh, it's now been cited uh, regularly. So just as an example quickly, we'll just touch on this so you can kind of learn about it briefly. Um, thousands and thousands of children now around the world are using camel milk for autism. Uh, but this is just a couple little things, um, little pictures right now quickly. Um, I have just done a new documentary with the um, Dungar College Green Chemical Research Center of India uh, with director Abdul Shahid. So this video is now available, uh, but talks all about it. But these are some children. Um, the one on the left was just in his own world. He was unable to really engage. He was deep in the computers. And then later he was able, after the camel milk, to just engage much more greatly. And he was playing and things like that. The one on the right uh, is quite dramatic in these photos even. Uh, he was two and a half years old. He was unable to, uh, to speak. He was smashing his head against all kinds of uh, furniture and cabinets. There was nothing that really could be done for this child. You can see the bruises on his head, the pink inflammation around his eyes, the swollen lips, the dark circles, which are called kind of allergy shiners. And uh, after the first ounce, his mother reported that his self-injurious behavior stopped. And then he was started, uh, language was flooding in was her term. And he started getting a social smile and awareness and his skin cleared up. Two years later, look at him on the right. He's very glowing um, with a social smile uh, child. So it transformed his health. So camels, because of reasons like this, led me to greater pastoral and nomadic awareness. So um, I've been to a lot of different places. Ma'am, you are muted. Oh. Okay, now it's okay. Okay, Were, was I muted from the beginning? No, ma'am, uh, this time you are muted, only for a few seconds. Oh, okay, so I, I was just muted briefly. Okay, got it. Okay, yeah. All right, so um, I've spoken to camelers from all over the world and uh, introduced camel people just to others to build this network, uh, because my goal was always to get camel milk into the hands of anyone that wanted it. And then the more I learned about pastoralists and nomadic people, the more I became aware of just how valuable not only the camel is, but then their other animals and everything that they do uh, for society and the environment. And I started writing about it, too, for different publications. So uh, pastoralist products and knowledge are outside the mainstream generally. Why is that? Uh, traditional livestock knowledge is held by rural cultures usually with very low visibility and sometimes credibility. People like to dismiss sometimes like, oh, those people, they're old fashioned or they don't know about this and that. Um, they, don't, they do not know what great knowledge generally people have had because that's kind of been lost. Um, lots of times people used to know, oh, certain cultures, they hold certain uh, knowledge of things, but a lot of times now we're not aware of what our heritage is anymore uh, in terms of the pastoralists that surround us in all the different countries. And so pastoralists and nomadic people, they're often on the move and are kind of not connected to settled areas sometimes um, if they're moving around. Um, some of them are very conservative and insular societies. And so sometimes people don't really know how to approach them. Um, and the products though are now emerging, which is great. Um, they do face steep odds of survival and we need to increase pastoral and nomads values to market society and preserve their land access. And of course, a picture here that I have to accompany is from the Amish uh, community. This one was in Pennsylvania. Um, Amish people, for those who are not aware, they um, are kind of from a culture or we, uh, that came to the United States, I think around the 1600s, 1700s. 
and they from very conservative faith based group and they really don't go outside of their group it's very insular and they dress uh, very traditionally and they don't have a lot of technology, um, but they were the ones that started milking camels because it enables them to stay on their land and work with animals. And they consider hard work part of their faith and living with an old technology way. So I now know many Amish camel farmers and this is milk and this is camel kefir, which is fermented camel milk. And then um, the, the soap and then um, they make uh, yogurt and things like that too. So one great example of things that are changing now is the International Year of Camelids in 2024 is coming up soon. So um, you can look this up and see what all the initiatives are in the interest of time tonight. We can't discuss all of them, but basically the goal is to increase consumptions of goods produced from camelids. And we know that they help contribute to the eradication of hunger, malnutrition. They help raise um, the empowerment of women. Uh, they help keep... Um, cultures that believe strongly in what they are doing as a spiritual and heritage practice, um, vibrant and on the land. And that is going to give us, that's challenging, but things are looking up in, in some places for camels. The International Camel Organization of Saudi Arabia is a relatively recent organization and they are doing um, outreach and fostering awareness. And uh, they've had um, camel symposiums. They've had one for my book and they've had one for some other of my colleagues here. And uh, so we'll see more from them. Also, there's World Milk Day, World Camel and Donkey Days, and all these things are chances to raise awareness on social media and perhaps even hold events in your areas. So the ways to increase pastoral and animal value and survival, science, human health, food, and then there's other things, uh, crafts, textiles, things like that. Um, this is actually uh, artificial insemination happening in uh, Dubai at uh, one of the world's great camel dairies uh, known as Camelicious. So camel milk, uh, let's we'll start with the food here. It's a food health connection, obviously. It's a small but growing health food industry, potential $1.2 billion industry in the next uh, 10 years, according to the FAO, very fast growing uh, in terms of a livestock animal. The demand, um, as my colleague, Dr. Ilsa will say, is, uh, has been rising a lot due to autism and other health consumers. Uh, plus, generally, there's um, interest in this from the Muslim meat and milk markets in different parts of the world. Um, it's not really supported by most governments yet. Um, things maybe will change, we hope. When I started this, there were only a few world dairies, and of course, there are many pastoral people, but not that many dairies. Now, there are many more around the world. Uh, Three million tons of camel milk are officially sold, but 70% is consumed by the owners and never reaches the market. And of course, uh, one dubious mark of success is fake or adulterated milk is starting to appear. Um, and more studies are emerging, quite, uh, quite a few. I mean, when I started this, when I had my idea that it would help autism, there was nothing. And now it's just so different in a lot of other health situations too. So camelids demonstrate the scientific value of pastoralists. Um, for a lot of reasons, camels are unique in the interest of time. We can't go into all their amazing qualities. But um, just in, as an example, lately, um, Cormac and Fifi, they are camel lids, which camels are part of the camel lid family. And their antibodies are very promising for COVID use. So, um, and I've actually uh, had some discussion with people that have been, been working on that. And um, I really hope that the funding on that continues. Um, now, this is one example of kind of a case report, I'll call it. Um, this is a woman that I know, she's a camelier. She's very well known because she helps in uh, natural disasters. She was recently diagnosed with type two diabetes. So she was put on all these drugs, pharmaceutical drugs, which made her feel very ill. So she thought, I'll try camel milk. The frozen helped, which is what a lot of us use, but not enough because most of us don't have access to raw, fresh or um, very safe, good camel milk. And uh, so she bought her own camels. She took 16 ounces a day for six months, stopped the insulin, stopped the trulicity for eight A1C, which is a measurement of uh, diabetes health, dropped to 5.5 on camel milk and metformin. Generally, they like to be under like six or so. And her blood sugar drops after she has the fresh camel milk and the pain in her hands has stopped too. Donkeys, they're also a highly challenged pastoralist asset. I never intended to get into camels, let alone donkeys. However, uh, one has led to the other and um, donkey milk is really amazing. It's been used medicinally since ancient times. Perhaps some of those of you in Europe know that. 
um, uh, the Romans used it reportedly, has very similar qualities to camel milk, anti-tumor, antibacterial, antiviral, et cetera. It's helping infants and people with PANS and PANDAS, a lot of children on the autism spectrum that have this PANS, PANDAS uh, uh, challenging uh, kind of neuropsychiatric, biologically driven uh, behavior, the donkey milk is helping them. Uh, but it's really sad what's happening because um, the demand, especially from China for the meat, hides and medicinal products are equaling catastrophic slaughter. In Kenya, 800,000 donkeys in three years are gone, and it may be pretty much diminished as a species in Kenya by 2023. So um, this is another uh, very challenged uh, pastoralist asset that I'd like to see uh, more protection for. And of course, in India, they have uh, donkey pastoralists. They're declining for the same reasons as camel milk. Uh, the herders are older, you know, the grazing challenges, uh, things like that and very, very low uh, dairy output. They don't give a lot of milk, but it's potentially very valuable. So like, here's a bottle I found for sale there. And of course, then you have your other things that can uh, boost the prospects of pastoralists um, and nomadic folks. Um, the traditional fabrics, handicrafts, soaps, cosmetics. A lot of people like to make soap out of their donkey milk, camel milk, goat milk. So. I mean, that has exploded a lot recently. I even see that over here, uh, donkey and uh, camel milk uh, soap. And then of course you have uh, like the beautiful hand woven uh, camel, uh, 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 it's kind of a blanket with a hole in the middle that the women make in India. That's my friend Netha Rika over there. And these are sheep uh, woolens that are being, scarves that uh, are being made in Bikaner, India um, on the right. So then there's also entertainment, tourism, racing, fairs and festivals, milking contests, rides and treks. And some people just want to spend time with the animals. Um, this is in Texas. Uh, this is Doug Baum. I've written about him and Camel Crazy, um, as well as other people, and uh, including Dr. Ilsa and also um, Dr. Razik, who's I think presenting later today. But uh, Doug actually has tourists come in and camel handlers too. So he does both. So this is uh, just an example of the U.S. Um, Amish Mennonite farm family. Uh, that's Marlon Troyer. The Troyer family milks uh, seven camels on 70 acres. However, they probably have more than that now. And uh, they have that very um, farm-focused, low-tech, pastoral-style culture that really values animals and that lifestyle. So pastoralist and nomadic wisdom is really worth saving. Livestock has been the backbone of society. Um, camels and cattle form the wealth status and trading ability of many cultures and their lifestyles can benefit us all, um, even if we just get a small piece of it. Uh, Sudanese camels grazing on rich natural pasture have approved omega-3s and offer human health benefits in the study. And as Dr. Ilsa referred to before, the animal soil interactions and droppings can improve the habitat the smaller species, seed spreading, uh, things like that. Now, this is a picture of the Lahawin tribe on the move after the rainy season. Um, this is a very recent picture, and it's just amazing to me that there are so many great uh, cultures out there doing incredible things, and very few people know about it. Just quickly, I'll introduce you to Sidi Amar. He's a Tuareg pneumatic camel herder from Niger. Um, he lives here. He trains camels. Um, he can sleep anywhere, adjust to any social group. He understands animals like there's no tomorrow. He was born in a camel caravan. He didn't have shoes until he was 16. And um, he is just a, a person that exemplifies many great traits of nomadic life. He says, if I knew them what I know now, I would be a nomad back home raising my camels. Everyone can benefit from pastoralist ways. So this is part of the messaging I'd like to see get out there. Societies are healthier with outdoor interaction. Nature helps us, enriches our bio microbiomes, which of course there's a gut-brain connection and uh, can produce healthier children when we're speaking about pregnancy. And so it's very important to, uh, to kind of live as naturally as you can when you're going to be um, having children because that decreases the risk of uh, certain developmental disorders. Um, exposure to dirt, so animals, sun and plants increases immune function. Um, teach children to be comfortable with nature, that's very important. And echoing nomadic traditions increases skills and self-sufficiency. Much better for children and people to learn how to do for themselves than to just open a plastic package for the 10th time that day. You know, learn how to actually do something and then uh, things will be better for you and your self-esteem and for our health of our world. 
I also believe engaging with people from other ways of life strengthens our world and creates courtesy and respect. And for people that are involved with children and yourself, schedule these opportunities or they probably will get over. Um, you are muted again. You are muted again. Yeah. Yeah, now it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. So engagement with nature is valuable. We've already talked about that. But as far as our talk here with pastoralist nomadic people, there was a study that showed nomadic children had better health than settled children. And uh, Somali seniors said they never saw children who could not sit or learn, sit still or learn uh, that had things like autism, ADHD back in their um, home place in Somalia. Um, they retain the wisdom of that pastoral way of life. And I consider them a human genetic legacy. And if we could, acknowledge, could utilize their knowledge through their traditions, then we could benefit. So as we know, pastoralists and nomadic people need help. Uh, there's a low demand for draft animals, water, grazing rights, and disinterest from youth, all these kind of things. Um, the loss of grazing increases camel illness and mange. Uh, there's always the challenge of the transportation of camel milk in these dry, arid countries. That is very challenging. Um, Dr. Ilsa has dealt with this on a regular basis. Um, belief systems and government do not overall support camel milk sales. Um, slowly, that's changing. Um, it's going to be a reach, but I think some of our Middle Eastern countries are doing better with that. Um, and uh, U.S. pastoralists are not nomads, and they share the similar challenge. I'm talking about the Amish people and people like that now, Mennonite people. Um, excessive milk regulations are very burdensome on them and on um, some of the other pastoralist people. And of course, COVID now, they need outreach uh, to maintain their healthy status. And some of them have been really hurt by uh, the lack of um, opportunities in COVID. This is just some posters that were put out by Advic. It's a camel milk company in India. I think that's uh, really nice to put out graphics like that. Uh, June 22nd is always World Camel Day. You can remember that. And of course, pastoralists and rangeland need peace and development. Um, personally, I like to say that I'd like to make safe zones between borders and cultures so that camel milk can come through and help children and sick, pe sick people. And to remember the nomadic tradition of giving camel milk for free. Um, I wish, I know that's a tough challenge because it's expensive to make and produce, but um, if the government could do this by sort of underwriting the milk and the herders, that would be really great. Um, early stage science funding is needed for pastoral resources. And then uh, Mongolia gives us a very good example for rangeland health. They have very wide intact rangelands and they have a lot of Bactrian camels there and they're being used increasingly in textiles, fashion, products for the international market. Uh, they have this uh, project called Green Gold and they have uh, 21 herder groups and they've instituted this code of practices. So the responsible nomads tracking system, it standardizes the steps for the st sustainability and they have this database. So it will make sure that all the herders do these things that protect wildlife, habitats, rare plants and increases household and female income, which is also common in camel cultures. So I think that's a very good role model what's going on with green gold in Mongolia. The next generation needs exposure to pastoralists and biodiversity as well. Otherwise, they are becoming increasingly uh, separated from animals. This is Truman the camel. He goes around in America with his owner and helps uh, uh, raise awareness. He also has helped raise money for a little girl in Pakistan that um, has autism and is deaf. And uh, I worked with his owner, Debbie, and uh, we have been able to raise uh, some money, uh, mostly due to her hard work and then some coordination from me uh, for the little girl to get tested for her hearing aids and autism. So it's a success that camel pastoralists are gaining ground because um, since I began, it was something that no one had ever heard of. Now thousands are using it for the milk. New research is continuing. New companies are distributing camel milk in many countries. There's new ones coming online all the time. And my dream of universal access to camel milk is coming true. And um, these are just some media examples of um, some things that I've been involved in. So uh, then uh, I wrote this book called Camel Crazy. Part of my goal was really to tell the amazing story of all the camel layers, the camel cultures, the milk, the science and everything about it. It was to put all that information in one place to help families, but also to raise the profile of pastoral and nomadic people and camels. So it will give you anything you want to know about camel milk, how to use it, how it works, where to get it, all that kind of stuff. 
And um, it also won a book award. So I attribute a lot of that to the incredible people that are in this book. So um, let's keep connected. Let's keep pastoral awareness going. Um, you can definitely find the book if you want anywhere, uh, but then I would love to hear from you for myself. And so those are just my socials. So um, I would really be happy to keep in touch and I'll be looking at the chat. I think I'm probably out of time. And uh, anyway, uh, so what do, is, is that? Uh, uh, we have you, enough time, please. You can continue. And I also request to Dr. Ilse to intervene in between uh, we, if you have opportunity. So please, okay. go ahead, no problem. Thank you. Well, Dr. Ilsa and I have been uh, been uh, lucky to be involved in a few things together. And uh, so I'm very pleased about that. I'm gonna look at the chat here too and see if there's anything. Yeah, slide presentations. Okay, I believe that uh, my slides will be available later. Um, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I don't see any um, particular questions for me, but um, my email is actually incorrect on um, that. Uh, there must've just been a little typo there. That's not my email, but if you want to write me then, um, then please get him on my social and then I can share it with you. I don't really like putting my email out in public because I get a lot of emails already, but um, it will be available to you um, at the school for anybody who would like it. Yeah. Dr. Ilsa, you want to uh, chat? You want to jump in on here? Dr. Ilsa actually um, was so kind to um, to, to be the questioner, um, I was doing that with ICO, they were doing a series of um, symposiums and their second one was on Camel Crazy and myself. And uh, Dr. Ilsa kindly came in as the questioner host and she always does a fantastic job. So um, I'm glad to be here with her again today. Um. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Christina, for uh, talking so much about camels. And uh, yes, I mean the the camel is an amazing resource, and it's it was it's a non-Western uh, domestic animal. It's not like the you know sheep, goat, cattle, and uh, and pigs. It comes you know from the uh, mostly from the Arab culture, and uh, so it was very. It, it, it has been spared a lot of that scientific attention, which actually, so it's not yet kept in industrial systems and it's pastoralists to keep uh, most of the camels and we need to make sure in the future that camel dairy doesn't fall into that trap of um, you know, also becoming industrialized. We need to you know develop a camel dairy sector that benefits the pastoralists uh, themselves rather than any uh, any corporations or so. So that's the, the big challenge uh, we're facing. Yes, um, I, another interesting part of that is camels. When I started this, um, I talk about it in the book. I went to this, our first kind of camel meeting here in America, and there were some investors from Beverly Hills coming in and uh, they came, they saw, they left quickly because they had kind of learned that you can't scale camel milk on a giant scale enough for them to put their money in and yank out a lot of it very quickly. So um, it's really kind of a labor of love. It's um, economically, it's kind of um, a challenge to scale, I think, and be profitable. Um, our farmers here though in America are doing quite well. Again, it's a very small industry, but our largest farmer, I'm not sure how many he has now. Last time I checked, he had about 140 camels. He probably has more now. Um, but that's considered a large farm here. Um, so, and the demand a lot is seasonal in America because- India, India is actually the only country where the camel population is going down, where the camel is very threatened. And this has become a big issue now here in Rajasthan and it's being discussed in the legislative uh, assembly in the Vidya Bhavan, what kind of measures to take. And we've been suggesting, you know, invest infrastructure into camel dairying, set up a network of, uh, small decentralized dairies throughout the camel breeding areas. And unfortunately, uh, again, I mean, this approach is taken now, oh, we're going to, the thing is in India, camels are not, cannot be slaughtered. Uh, so they were earlier used only for transportation. And then when that purpose uh, 
went away because of uh, mechanization, etc. Uh, there was actually no more rationale for keeping camel, and and that's why it's becoming uh, extinct because they they can't be used for meat, and there's no infrastructure to uh, develop the dairy. So. Um, we are really hoping that, you know, somebody will recognize the value of the camel for uh, nutrition, I mean, for diabetes patients, for autistic children, for tuberculosis patients. And we're actually at the moment uh, providing camel milk for free to a school and to um, poor tribal children from, uh, you know, from poor backgrounds, as well as uh, some tuberculosis patients and the the, the effects are really uh, enormous. So I, we're hoping that the camel conservation, which is a state animal of Rajasthan, that that can be linked actually to public health. If there was a way of distributing uh, camel milk um, also to pregnant mother and lactating mothers, because it has very high vitamin C and iron content, it's the ideal um, remedy for anemia, which is so widespread. So. Um, Yes, anybody who listens. <laughs> yeah. Really needs to yeah. for the camel, you know, in Rajasthan. Now, to put it on the right track, the government has realized that there's a problem. Uh, and we're just hoping it will take the right steps now. Well, your tireless work has been a key part of this. And um, I really do believe that dairy is a, a, a kind of um, a hope for... Um, camels and donkeys because they're so challenged in other ways. Um, and as far as the, you know, the sustainability, um, it is kind of nice to see the, the camel industry in a way is very hands-on. Um, I mean, the people here, and I know of course, in a lot of the pastoralist cultures, but even people here that have a big farmhouse and a big farm property, they're very settled. They're not you know, nomadic. The camels live outside their window. The camels live around them. They can hear them at night. They're taking care of them constantly. So it's it's sustainable, it's low. It's not like there's a factory there or anything. It's a very hands-on thing. So um, I think that's a wonderful thing. And then also we mustn't forget climate change because um, the, uh, the camel, it may not give as much milk, but what it does give is a powerhouse. And then of course it doesn't impact the environment nearly as much and it takes a lot less water um, than cows do, like a, a huge amount. So um, I think that there is really, you cannot really say much bad about the camel. Um, now I will point out that in Australia, unfortunately, camels and donkeys are still being killed officially. I know they cause some damage to some of the land there, but um, the camels do, but that's really because they're not really utilized as a resource. Um, and water is also an increase, increasing um, you know, global problem. So to have an animal that takes less water is so survivable is a great thing. And uh, I guess for the, one of the last things I would say is that um, the camel and the camel lids have incredible science value that even though I'm starting to see progress, it's amazing in a short time, there's so much more to go. There is so much to this animal and to camel lids and to some of our other pastoralist animals that's just been completely um, unexamined by uh, science. It may not be the most profitable, but it may be the most beneficial. Okay, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your uh, wonderful and amazing presentation. It was, a, um, it was very informative and you will find um, uh, many uh, uh, comments in the chat box uh, that appreciated your presentation. And uh, uh, the most amazing part was uh, that your real life experiment and uh, it, it was great part uh, of this uh, presentation. And uh, it is very great to hear that your son, um, after all, returned to the school. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your uh, uh, nice presentation. I would like to invite uh, now the next presenter, next expert. Uh, would you please unshare the screen, ma'am? Yes. Thank you. You are welcome. 